The question that I most often get is, Stephen, do your models also apply in a B2B world? Now, the short answer is yes, they do apply in a B2B world. But I get this question so often that I wanted to make a specific presentation for all my friends in B2B markets. Because this is an interesting moment in time to look at the changes in B2B markets. Huh? Reality is that in the last year and a half, we've seen a lot of change. Uh, forced change, overnight change. We've seen how sales became remote. We've seen how events turned into virtual events. Trade shows became virtual trade shows. We've also seen the importance of digital marketing growing rapidly in B2B because of the reduction of time and effort that we had in the physical world. And at the same time, as a consequence because of that, many B2B marketeers started to understand the real importance of branding in their environment. And, and this presentation is basically an open invitation to all my friends in the B2B world. It's not because we were successful in the past 20 years that we can use the same knowledge to move into the next era that is waiting for us. I believe that we're going to see a lot of change in customers' expectations, not just in consumer markets, but also in business markets. And I wanted to apply my Offer You Can't Refuse model. That's also the title of my latest book. I wanted to apply this model specifically to B2B. Um, and, and there are four components in this model that I believe bring value to any kind of customer that you may have to deal with. Now, the, the bottom of everything, and this is obvious, huh? the bottom of everything is that you need a good product, you need good service, you need good price. We all know that. That used to be the minimum demand for ages, right? Now, what we've seen because of the big digital jump forward of the last 16 months, we've seen that digital convenience is also part of that new minimum. It, it almost feels like we have some sort of a zero tolerance for digital inconvenience. And, and believe me, this is not just a consumer thing. This happens in B2B markets as well. B2B buyers want to have convenient solutions. Just ask yourself how much time you invest in a new application that you install on your phone. If it doesn't bring value instantly, you don't, you lose, you don't use it, or worse, you become a little bit frustrated. And this is something that has been underestimated in business markets. And the answer when, when you know, th this is something that happened often. Huh? You go in a B2B company and they tell me, Stephen, our customers are not ready yet for these apps and these dig digital applications. And then I ask them, why? Why did you come to that conclusion? They said, well, we launched something and no one used it. In my opinion, that does not mean that the customer is not ready for it. It just means that the solution wasn't good enough. B2B buyers, B2B customers are looking for convenient solutions more than ever. And I, I just want to show you this one example that I'm a huge fan of. It's from a B2B company, Barco. They invented ClickShare. And ClickShare was the solution for many embarrassing moments that we've all been through in our physical meetings. Huh? Remember the moment when you walked into a meeting room and you said, can I, can I connect my computer to the screen here? I want to show you my sales presentation. Then there's always that awkward moment that you have to crawl underneath a table to connect the cables. And then you think, oh, I'm going to connect them, and I'm going to push a button. And you always think when you push a button that it will work. That's our expectation. But sometimes, you know, we push the button, we came back, we popped on top of the table, and then this happened. It became a complete failure. And this is the solution that ClickShare brought. They created a convenient solution for an embarrassing moment in many B2B meetings. And since we all have that, we do not want to climb underneath the table anymore. Today, we have a zero tolerance for digital inconvenience on multiple domains. And the consequence is that because of that, and it's a consequence of the big digital jump forward of the past year and a half, is that digital convenience has become some sort of a commodity. So the question is, what comes next? How are we going to proceed after this moment? And I think that if you, want to, you know, if you want to consider your options in the digital world for B2B marketing, it's important to think about customer values. Ask yourself, what kind of value can we bring to our customers? What kind of benefits can we create for our customers? And I like to play with these three benefits. How can we use technology? How can we use data to create faster than real-time solutions? How can we use technology and data to create hyper-personalized solutions? Because it's not about the average customer, it's about the individual customer. And how can we become more convenient than ever? Data is going to be our key ingredient to get there. 
this here is, in my opinion, the circle of life of artificial intelligence. You have a great product. You have users of that product. Those users generate data, and that data helps you to improve your services. And the faster this wheel spins in your organization, the faster you will run away from your competitors. Let, let's look at this example, ISS. Uh, one of the largest facility companies in the world. They have more than 500,000 people on their payroll. Um, and you could think this is a conservative industry, a facility management of companies. But these guys are extremely innovative. They have this idea, they have this concept where they place sensors in the buildings where they do the maintenance for. And these sensors almost, you know, it, it almost feels like that building is coming to life because now they know how these buildings are being used. Thanks to the sensors and the data that those sensors produce, they know which aisles are overused, which aisles are underused. They know which meeting rooms are underused or overused. Same for toilets, same for vending machines, same for coffee machines. Because of this data and the knowledge that they gather from that, they can solve problems in those buildings before they actually occur. They can offer service that is more personalized than ever and they can do it in a convenient way. The circle of life of their data management is creating this benefit for them and for their customer. Uh, the most simple example or the simplest benefit for them is this. If they have to refill the coffee machine, thanks to this technology, they always refill it at the exact right moment. Uh, they're not too late or not too early. They come at the exact right moment. Customer happy, more efficient to them. That's leveraging your data. That's creating benefits for your customers faster than real time, anticipating. That's personalized. Not every building has the same needs. And that creates the most convenient solution for everyone. And then if you think about it, the interface, the digital interface that you will use more and more in your B2B company towards your customers will have these four characteristics. The future of B2B digital interfaces are invisible. The customer will not even see them. Like those sensors for ISS, you don't see them, but they're there. They're invisible. They're fully personalized. They require less and less effort from the user, and they handle in a proactive way. Let, let me show you another example. Let's take Kony, a Finnish elevator company. Their dream is to create the ultimate passenger experience. I love that, huh? the passenger experience in an elevator. But what do people really want to avoid when you step into an elevator? Right, you don't want to get stuck into it. So these guys from Kony, they created this new philosophy to do preemptive maintenance. And they almost programmed it as some sort of a joke. Huh? They let the elevators talk to each other. So there's this one elevator saying, oh, I'm feeling a little bit warm. There must be something wrong. And then the other says, no, 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 no. It's a warm day. You're, you're fine. Don't worry about it. Ah, thank God. And then the elevator is like, yeah, but uh, th did you hear that sound when I landed? And the other one says, yeah, I heard that. That didn't sound good, did it? No, it didn't. Shall we call a human? Yeah. Let's call a human. And then a human comes and does preemptive maintenance. Th this is a brilliant way of communicating but it shows the benefits that you can create thanks to this technology. It shows how B2B service will become completely proactive instead of reactive. And, and you know the coolest thing about these Kony elevators is you can go to their website, you can select their, your favorite elevator in the world, and then you can tap into those conversations. So if you ever wondered what elevators talk about, you can figure that out if you check the Kony website right now. But again, let's dive into the details of this example. The Kone elevators are an invisible interface that's fully personalized. Every elevator is different. It requires zero effort from the customer, and they handle in a proactive way. And if you use that mindset in your B2B context, at the end of the day, you will create transactional perfection for your customers. And now we have to talk about something else. All these new technologies, the digital tools that we're going to have, they provide us the possibility to go direct to consumer. And I know this is something that many B2B companies do not want to talk about for multiple reasons. But I believe that you have to put it on the table. Maybe you don't have to sell directly to the end user, but getting information from the end user, understanding how the end user is using your products, and facilitating the sales and helping maybe your dealerships with that, that is something to put on the table. And, and let, let's look at this company. It's a company called Extremis. 
they make beautifully designed furniture, especially outdoor furniture. They, they make furniture for the Apple campus, for the Google campus. They're huge. And they sell 100% B2B. That's what they do. But still, when you go to their website, and they created a new website earlier this year, they now have many, many tools that are specifically targeting the end user. Uh, they have a configurator. They have details about the products. They're not selling it here online, but they're facilitating the sales with the end user. And I think having a mindset that at the end of the day, the person at the end of the chain is, has to be happy with what you deliver, has to become part of our mindset if we want to create that digital optimization and create digital perfection for our customers. And, and this is where we are today. People expect these digital tools. People expect B2B companies to be up to speed. And then the question pops, if this is seen as the most normal thing in the world, then what do people expect beyond convenience? And if we want to create an offer we can't refuse for our B2B customers, I like to play with two dimensions on top of the minimum demand. On the one hand, ask yourself, how can your company become a partner in life of your customers? And on the other hand, how can your company add value to society? And if you manage to combine those two, you create an offer you can't refuse for your customers. But it's a matter of building that, right? It's a matter of building that. So on top of the minimum demand, it's about becoming a partner in life. Now, I've, I've created this word for my book, Partner in Life. And because I call it partner in life, many B2B companies have the reflection of like, oh, this is not for us because we're a partner in business. It's the, it's, don't focus on the terminology because this is indeed partner in business, partner in life. It's about the mindset of helping people in a way that you go further than just selling a product. It's a mindset where you try to create positive change for your customer in a way that it goes beyond your product. And let me use a crazy metaphor. Uh, and I warn you, this is going to sound a little bit crazy, but I, I hope you're going to join me in this metaphor. Just bear with me. Uh, imagine that tomorrow morning you wake up and you're no longer in your cozy, warm bed in your beautiful house somewhere out there in this wonderful world. But you look around and you're no longer in your own bed, but you think, oh my God, I have turned into a rhino. Uh, imagine that. I, I don't know if you've ever spent time on that, thinking what your life would look like if you were a rhino. Uh, probably no time at all. But the good news is that if you become a rhino and you wake up somewhere in Kenya, that your first concern would be the same as a human. You would be looking for some food and drinks. So that's the good news. The bad news is nature made a mistake. Nature assumed that a rhino would have no natural enemies. Because if a lion bumps into a rhino, the lion is like, no, we're not going to have this for lunch. Let's look for the zebra. That's a safer choice. So a rhino has no natural enemies. And because of that, nature made a mistake. They didn't give all the premium features to the rhino. Uh, like a rhino doesn't have great eyesight. A rhino doesn't have great smelling capability. So it's an easy target unfortunately, for humans, for poachers. So this is a problem out there. But thank God the rhino has a partner in life. The oxpecker, the little birds that travel on the back of the rhino. And these birds don't just eat the parasites from the back of the rhino. They also function as some sort of an alarm system. Because these birds, they have great eyesight. And they, they spot humans from a far distance. And then they're like, there's a human uh, approaching and then the, that bird makes a different sound and the rhino recognizes the sound and the rhino is like okay there must be a human around I have to run that is a partner in life the ox pecker is the, pe the perfect metaphor of being a partner in life you're always around without being intrusive and you add value at the exact right moment at the exact right moment Every B2B company can think like this. You're always around without being intrusive, and you add value at the exact right moment. That's who we want to be. Uh, we don't want to be the fly on the back of the cow that's always annoying the cow and she wants us to be removed as soon as possible. No, we want to be the ox pecker on the back of the rhino. And the quality that you need to succeed in that is empathy. 
understand that there's a human on the other side of the table. Think about the human behind the customer. Understand that the human behind the customer has like a movie in her head, in his head, about their ambitions, about the dreams that they still have, the fears that they may have of working with you, the fears for their own career. How well can you understand the movie that your customers have about their own life? And how can you be a positive facilitator of change there? How can you add value in a more complete way? Let me show you a B2B example of a company in, the f in a conservative market, the construction world, that really understood how to apply this in B2B markets. It's a company called Wautim. It's a painting company. They paint buildings, they paint stores, they paint hotels, they paint soccer stadiums. And they're really good at that. They were very successful. Uh, they are very successful. But suddenly they had this new client, a big client called Center Parks, big leisure player, entertainment company in, uh, in Europe. And these guys rent out small houses to customers for a week or a couple of days. And these houses need renovation. So there was this big pitch. And they said, hey, guys from Wow Team, do you want to do, do the paint work of these little houses that we rent out? And Wow Team said, sure, of course, we're going to do a pitch. But they listened very well. And that customer mentioned several times in that sales process, like, OK, at least uh, the paint job is done now. Now let's go for the guys that do the flooring. Let's go for the guys that will fix the doors. Let's talk with the guys who will do the kitchen work. And the guys at Wow Team, they heard this. And they said, oh, this is apparently a big issue, a big concern, a big fear that things will go wrong for this client. Why don't we solve this? Why don't we become a partner in life for them? And they made this offering. They said, you know what? We're, we're great in paint work, but we know a lot about the construction work as well. Why don't you allow us to do the renovation, the full renovation of all these houses that you guys rent out? And Center Parks was the first client that actually gave them that permission and said, wow, you guys are actually adding value for us here. This is great. This is exactly what we need. You have the job. And they started working like that. And they started to offer that to other clients, to different industries. And they, they won tender after tender because they understood what played here in the mindset of their customers. And proactively, they added that solution to them. They became a partner in life. How can you add value in a way that it goes beyond your product? Uh, it's a traditional example. It's, it's not about selling cars anymore. It's about being a partner in mobility. It's not about finding financial or fixing financial transactions. No, it's about helping people with a worry-free financial planning. If you're in B2B services, imagine that you're in executive search. It's not about executive search. It's about being a partner in achieving great leadership. That's what you actually try to achieve. And if you understand that, that's the moment when you can become a partner in life. And this is, of course, also the moment where the humans comes in, uh, come in. I mean, I've been talking about technology for the last couple of minutes, but that doesn't mean that humans don't play a vital role anymore in B2B marketing and sales. On the contrary, I would say. Uh, there's this old economic law. It's the law of scarcity. It tells us when something becomes scarce, it actually increases in value. Well, in the past year and a half, the humans, the human touch, in B2B sales and marketing has never been lower than today. And because of that, it's more valuable than today. Because of that, it's more premium than ever to be helped by a human. But it means for us in B2B leadership and B2B customer experience, it means that we really have to focus on the core capabilities of the humans in the customer experience. Because technology can take care of a lot of things in the process. So what do our humans need to do in B2B customer experience? The answer is simple. The humans need to excel in those fields where computers are not good at. And we need to excel in those typical human values. Empathy, um, passion, enthusiasm, creativity, the positive energy transfer when humans are put together in a room. That's what you need to focus on. And the cool thing is the more digital the world will become, the more valuable these human aspects will become as well. Computers personalize, people make it personal. That's what we need to do in B2B marketing and sales, make it personal. And, and the one mistake that we cannot make is this one. It's not because we happen to be human that we're good in those human capabilities. That's not always the case. If we add a human to the sales process, a human can increase the experience. But let's be honest, a human can also decrease the experience. The challenge is this one. 
computers deliver what they promise to deliver, we humans, we can do more. We can over-deliver. And we need to be ready for a world where digital will, be, will have a bigger place than before. It's not because the world opens up again that all these new digital possibilities that we have will, will disappear like snow when the sun sh starts to shine. That's not what will happen. Look at this graph. It clearly shows that in the beginning of the pandemic, most B2B salespeople were not open to selling online. A few months after that, the majority started to understand that you can also find new clients with online sales. And this is a mindset that we need to have because a lot of B2B salespeople are just waiting until the world you know, goes back to what it used to be, but that will never happen. Today, we will have to understand that we will also have to scale our human touch through a screen. It's going to be part of the job forever. So in this presentation, I just want to quickly insert three tips of what you can do if you are in B2B sales to add and scale the human touch through digital channels. And they're very simple. You can start using them as from, for to, as from tomorrow. Uh, first one is this. Send more and more personal digital messages. Show your clients that you think about them even when you're not in a sales process. When, when you see something from their organization, send them a WhatsApp saying, hey, I just noticed this, great job. Or I saw this crazy thing that just happened. Are you okay? Is everything all right? Can I do something for you? Having those in-between interactions that are not linked to doing business is just something that you show that you care about them as a human. And it costs you zero budget. It's just a mindset. And we have the digital tools. Everyone has WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger or another direct messaging platform. Use it. Uh, the second one is if we will see our customers less face to face, and even if the world opens up, I think we should live with the hypothesis, hypothesis that we will see less of each other in real life. Well, that increases the value of following your customers on social media. Check them out on LinkedIn, check them out on Twitter, check them out on Instagram, become part of their digital life. Uh, and then some people tell me as, as a question or they ask me, Stephen, is every client open for that? No, not every client is open for, for that, but that's not a problem. Focus on the ones who are open for that. And if they do something great, if you see that their you know, oldest son became 12, just send them a small congratulations. People appreciate that. It's very simple, it's very attentive, and it's part of scaling the human touch through digital channels. And then the last tip that we I mean, should consider is if you organize a virtual event, and I assume a lot of you have organized virtual events and will organize virtual events in the near future. Make sure that if you build your agenda, that you don't just focus on the formal part of the meeting, but make sure that you leave time for the informal part of the meeting as well, so that you have the chance to chit chat and that you can scale your human touch through digital channels. Make sure that you understand the human behind the customer, even if you don't see each other in real life. It's about empathy, feeling what the others are feeling and trying to deal with that, trying to work with that. And the best combination is if you figure out how to combine empathy with timing. Understanding what people feel and proactively dealing with that, proactively helping them to solve something, that's the moment when you become a partner in life. That's the moment when you become the ox pecker on the back of the rhino. Partner in life. And then we have the last part of the model, the top of the model, having an impact on society. Um, look, more and more people out there are looking for organizations to take their responsibility. We face a lot of global challenges. There's a lot on our plate. Uh, we still have a big fight against racism and discrimination. We have a climate issue that is becoming more and more urgent every single day. And we had the biggest healthcare crisis of our generation with a devastating impact on individuals and businesses. There's a lot on our plate, and we know that. And your customers are looking to your organization to become part of the solution. There's even a bigger level of trust that business leaders can cope with these global challenges than government leaders can. And about 75% of the world's population is looking at business leaders to proactively become part of the solution. Let's, let's dive into 
the B2B printing industry, a company that I know very well, a company called uh, Verstraten IML. It's a company based in Belgium, very close to where I live and where I was born. And it's a company that used to be a traditional printing company, but today they are the world leader in in-mold label printing. World leader. And in-mold label printing means that you, that you fix labels on plastic packaging, but you don't feel it. It's not glued on there. It's like it's completely integrated, right? And, and they were the first ones in the world who invented this concept. And, and companies like P&G and Nestlé and Danone, they loved this. But because of that, I mean, others started to copy that. And then we had pressure on the prices. And it almost felt like they would enter a product price kind of market. That was their feeling. But then a couple of years ago, the war on plastic become, became a huge issue. And their top clients, the Procter & Gamble's, the Nestle's, the Danone's, the Unilever's, they said, you know what, we're part of this problem. A lot of the single-use plastic is just from our product, so we have to reduce that dramatically. Now, if your big clients, your biggest clients are saying, we're going to stop using plastic, that's a moment if you're selling plastic packaging to them that you have trouble finding sleep that day. Huh? And you can do two things at that moment. You can put your head in the sand, or you can say, let's figure out a way how we can be part of the solution. And they became part of the solution. And they created this project internally, together with some of their clients, has a beautiful name. They call it the Holy Grail Project, the Holy Grail Project. And I mean, if you call a project the Holy Grail Project, you almost need a standing ovation by definition. Huh? But it is the Holy Grail, because their goal is this. They want to make sure, together with their clients, that plastic becomes 100% recyclable, composable, or reusable. That's the holy grail. And the truth is, they're very close in achieving that. They created what they call virtual watermarks. On the left-hand side of this slide, what you see is a traditional kind of packaging, like from ice cream or any kind of product that you would buy. It's what our eyes see. On the right-hand side of this slide, you see the digital watermark. That's what the eye of the computer can see. And this digital watermark, it contains all kinds of information specifically for the sorting machines. So thanks to this digital watermark, the sorting machines can now specifically know what kind of product was in there. And they can use that information to become much, much better in recycling. And the moment that all sorting machines will have the right scanning devices, we will move into a world of 100% recyclability of pl plastic packaging, and the problem of single-use plastic will be removed or will be reduced dramatically out of this world. And this is a fantastic example of a B2B company, a market leader, that you know, became part of a big storm, but they became part of the solution, and at the same time, they changed the world. They are saving the world because of this uh, action and this strategy. But maybe you're thinking, hey, Steven, we're in a different market. Um, changing the world is probably too difficult for us. And I can understand that. I don't think the goal of every B2B company is to change the world. I think the goal should be to change your world. How can you use the strengths that you have to have a positive impact on society? Uh, I, I recently got invited by the leadership team of this company, of PPG, to do a, a presentation about the future of customer experience. And PPG is a fantastic company. It's a brilliant company. They are the world leader in, in paint production. They're very innovative. And I got to know them during this meeting. And I was really intrigued by their PPG community. Because the goal that they have in, in, in the world is to beautify the world. That's what they want to do with their paint. But reality is that in many communities out there, you have many buildings that don't have the potential and the power to make sure that their own building is being, you know, ha has the right maintenance, if you know what I mean. They don't have the budget for it. Then you think about schools, elderly homes, uh, places where children go out and play. So this is what PPG wants to do. They create a PPG community. They take their own paint. They take their own employees. And they go to these buildings, and they paint them. And every year, they paint more than 300 buildings like this. And by doing so, they want to contribute to society. They want to use their strength to add value to society. Do you change the world? Probably not, but you change your world. And that's exactly what you can do. And that's how you can create an impact, both for your employees, for society, and for your customers. Because customers appreciate it if you take your responsibility. And, and there you go. Huh? Then you have four layers. 
that bring value to B2B customers these days. Of course, a great product service price, of course. Digital convenience and new digital interfaces. Partner in life, the ox packer on the back of the rhino, and changing your world. And if you figure out a way how to combine these four components in one experience, in one storyline, that is the moment when you create an offer you can't refuse. And this is where we are today. The ultimate convenience in B2B markets is seen as a commodity. And your customers expect more. Your customers expect you to go beyond convenience. So my invitation to all of you is this one. How far are you up in this model? Where are you doing a good job and can you do more? Where do you need to catch up? And maybe some of you are thinking, oh, this is great news, this talk, because we are working on all four of these dimensions. Of course, we have people in R&D working on products. We have our digital team. We have our account team that is deepening customer relations. And we have some people working on CSR. This is great. We're actually doing this. But if you will dive deeper, there's a big chance that indeed your organization, organization is working on these four components, but in a disconnected way. And then the question is, what is the impact? Do customers know? Do they feel it? Do your employees know? Do they feel it? It only works if you connect them. It only works if you win in one experience. Maybe some of you were thinking, hey, Steven, in our B2B market, you know, product price, my friend, is the only thing that matters. We are in a product price market. And you know what? That would be the best news of the day. Because that means that today, if you want to make a difference, if you want to win, you just need to be 20% better in digital convenience and you will make a difference. That's how you can play today. If you look at the day after tomorrow, I'm convinced that pretty soon you will feel the need to invest in all four of these. And, and my final invitation to all of you is this one. Dare to dream. Dare to challenge yourself. Dare to look at what you could do on each four of those components. What would be the ultimate situation in each of these four components? and then reverse engineer it back to today and start building that. But don't begin with what you have and incrementally improve it. Dare to dream and see what you can do. And then you reverse engineer it and you start to build an offer people cannot refuse. This is what I had for you here today, everyone. Uh, the future of customer experience and B2B markets. If you like my work, please subscribe to my channel, follow me on Instagram, like the video, and share it with everyone you know who is working in B2B customer experience. Thank you very much for watching.